Have you ever driven down the highway and seen a really strange looking rock? I mean, a rock that really made you pause and think, what in the world is that? How did that form? Why is it that way? It's tempting to think that these things defy explanation, but you couldn't be further from the truth. Historical geology relies on an overarching idea called uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is the concept that all of the processes that apply to the world today have always operated on Earth, and more broadly throughout the universe overall. Our planet is now and has always been influenced by certain natural laws. Natural laws like gravity. It's a pretty safe assumption that there has always been gravity since the beginning of time and certainly since the formation of our planet. It is likely that other things like wind, moving water, and ice have always existed as well. So we can assume that there has always been weathering and erosion on Earth. Weathering and erosion occur very slowly, usually too slowly to observe with the naked eye. But we know they occur, and we can assume that they have always been occurring. Armed with this knowledge, we can make sense of the world around us. The landscapes on Earth, the rocks and fossils themselves, have been shaped over time by processes that still occur today. Why do canyons contain rivers? Because rivers are agents of weathering and erosion. They break down rock and transport fragments away. Over time, they cut down into rock and create canyons. Some rivers have been carving canyons for millions of years. When it comes to uniformitarianism, there are two sides to the coin, gradualism and catastrophism. Gradualism, not surprisingly, refers to the idea that changes on Earth result from slow, continuous, gradual processes occurring over time. Again, think of a river creating a canyon. The river has been slowly and constantly removing material from the bedrock for millions of years. On the flip side, there is catastrophism. The idea that changes on Earth occur suddenly and rapidly due to catastrophic events that occur intermittently. Picture a flood. Floods occur relatively suddenly and last for relatively short periods of time, on the order of days. They cause weathering and erosion and transport sediment to places where it is deposited. Although floods aren't gradual, they are a natural part of our planet and are certainly agents of change. Another example of catastrophism is asteroid impacts. It's hard to appreciate, but our planet has probably been influenced by space rocks throughout its history. Space rocks have shaped our planet in a number of ways by suddenly and catastrophically falling to Earth. How do we know this? One only needs to look at the cratered surfaces of our moon and our sister planet, Mars, to see that collisions between planets and space rocks are a natural process in our solar system. One doesn't need to look so far away either. There is a lot of evidence for these collisions here on Earth, including craters produced by impacts. Here, you can see the Beringer Meteor Crater, also known as the Meteor Crater Natural Landmark. It's located near Flagstaff, Arizona. It's about 4,000 feet in diameter and 600 feet deep. It formed 50,000 years ago when an iron nickel meteorite struck the earth at a speed of at least 30,000 miles per hour. The meteorite itself was mostly vaporized during the collision, 
but a few fragments have been recovered from the site. But there are many other craters too. Most of these craters cannot be seen from the ground. They have been worn down by weathering and erosion or covered by sediment, so they are no longer visible. The largest impact crater in the US is the Manson Crater, located near Manson, Iowa. It formed when a meteorite collided with Earth 74 million years ago. Since then, the crater has been filled. But underground, the structure is still apparent in the form of distinctive breccias and shocked quartz grains, which were produced during the collision. These craters provide evidence for catastrophes that likely had huge consequences for the planet. You have probably learned that the dinosaurs were killed by an asteroid impact at Chicxulub in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico around 66 million years ago. This is probably true. Although there is some debate among scientists about what exactly caused the mass extinction of dinosaurs, there is near universal agreement that there was a huge impact in the Yucatan around 66 million years ago, right around the time that the dinosaurs met their demise. It is very likely that this impact would have sent rock, ash, and other debris into Earth's atmosphere causing changes in climate and environments that may have led to the demise of dinosaurs and many other life forms on Earth. But this mass extinction is not alone. There is some evidence to suggest that other impacts were responsible for the extinction of life throughout Earth history. At first glance, gradualism and catastrophism seem diametrically opposed, but they are simply extreme opposite views of how our planet has come to be. They are two sides of the same coin. The Earth today is a reflection of slow continuous processes as well as short-lived events that seem catastrophic in comparison. Let's return now to the rocks. If uniformitarianism is true, then we can make reasonable assumptions about how rocks must have formed simply by looking at them. The study of Earth history is based on a number of principles which serve as the foundation for all work in historical geology. The first principle is called the principle of original horizontality. It is the idea that sedimentary rocks must form in horizontal strata. When sediment is deposited, it has a tendency to spread out due to gravity rather than pile up endlessly. The sediment spreads out into layers called strata. Of course, not all strata are horizontal. Some occur at angles or are perpendicular to the ground. If you find angled or vertical strata, it means that they were tilted by geologic processes after they formed. Strata are often tilted, folded, and distorted by the geologic processes that create mountains. We call these processes tectonic processes because they are caused by the collision of tectonic plates. Mountain building involves a lot of geologic force. Mountains can form where two land masses or tectonic plates collide with each other. Today, the Himalayas include the tallest mountains in the world, including Mount Everest. But 50 million years ago, they did not exist. 50 million years ago, the Himalayan mountains began to form when a tectonic plate called the Indian plate collided with another called the Asian plate. At that time, the land masses were both located close to sea level. However, the collision caused the land masses to buckle and the Asian plate to be uplifted. 
This buckling and uplift folded and bent many of the rocks in the Himalayas. A second important concept is called the principle of superposition. This principle is simple. Generally speaking, when you are looking at horizontal strata, old rocks occur below young rocks. Young strata are superimposed on top of old strata. Consider how you might build a cake. The same principle applies. The lowest layer is the oldest layer. It obviously went down first. The uppermost layer is the youngest layer, with all other layers falling in between. Looking downward at a cake, we can look backward through time. That said, it's not always so easy. If rocks can be tilted and angled and distorted after they form, that means they can also be flipped over entirely. If so, the youngest rocks may occur below the oldest rocks. Don't worry though, this is fairly uncommon. You can usually tell which way is up. A third principle is called the principle of lateral continuity. The definition is a bit of a mouthful, but the concept is pretty straightforward. Because sediment is deposited in three dimensions, strata extend outward in all directions until they quote unquote pinch out or butt up against this edge of their depositional environment. Again, think back to the sand in the jar. The boundaries of the strata are readily apparent. The strata pinch out where they become thin and they terminate against the glass. In between, they are continuous layers. It might be hard to appreciate at first, but this is a very important principle. Think back to how canyons form. Rivers cut down in the rock beneath, weathering it, eroding it, and creating a fracture. In this example, you can see how the rock strata has previously spanned the area now occupied by the canyon. The layers were continuous across the area before the river cut down through them. For this reason, we can draw lines and connections between strata like these in the canyon. We know that they are one and the same. We call this stratigraphy. It is the branch of geology focused on the order and positions of strata as well as their ages. A fourth important principle is called the principle of cross-cutting relationships. You've learned that old sedimentary rock strata tend to occur below young ones. But what about igneous rocks? Igneous rocks don't form the same way. They form when hot fluid magma cools into either extrusive igneous rock on the surface or intrusive igneous rock in the subsurface. Intrusive igneous rocks can form inside and between existing sedimentary rock strata. Faults or fractures that can displace rock can also form within sedimentary rock strata. The principle of cross-cutting relationships tells us that in cases where one rock or structure interrupts the continuity of another, the structure doing the interrupting is younger. This is fairly intuitive, but takes time to appreciate. A sedimentary rock must exist in the first place before it can be interrupted by an intrusive igneous rock or fault. Look closely at the example in this picture. The image illustrates four horizontal sedimentary rock strata, as well as a dike, an intrusive igneous structure. The dike must have formed after the sedimentary rocks, as it interrupts the continuity of all of them. It cross cuts all of them. 
The surfaces of these sedimentary rocks show signs of weathering and erosion. Since weathering and erosion affected both the sedimentary and igneous rocks, it must have occurred after all of them. A related principle is called the principle of included fragments. Again, the principle is hard to appreciate at first, but makes a lot of sense. According to this principle, if a rock contains a fragment of something, like another piece of rock or a fossil, then the rock must be younger than the fragment. Again, an example is helpful. Think about how a fossil forms. Fossils come from organisms. Those organisms live, die, and are buried in sediment that becomes sedimentary rock. The organism must have lived before the sediment was deposited. The fossil fragment must be older than the rock around it. A final principle worth pointing out is called the principle of faunal succession. This principle is relatively simple. Faunal refers to fossils of animals. According to this principle, the oldest fossils occur below the youngest fossils in a sequence of strata. This idea makes a lot of sense given the principle of superposition, which tells us that older strata occur below younger strata. And the principle of included fragments indicates that the fossils must be older than the strata themselves. Altogether, these principles support one view of geology. As you can see, these principles provide the tools to look at the rocks in a place and determine the order in which they formed. They help you to identify the sequence of events that must have happened in the past. Which stratum formed first, second, third? Is the igneous rock older or younger than the sedimentary rock? When did the fault form? How old are the fossils? These are the questions that motivate work in historical geology. With an understanding and appreciation for these principles, you now have the necessary knowledge to take your own trips backward in time and look closely at Earth history.